Well, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar held in association with the Clydesdale and Yorkshire Bank and entitled, What Does the Future of Farming Look Like Post-COVID and Brexit? I'm Philip Clark, Executive Editor at Farmers Weekly, and uh, we'll be chairing this evening's event. To say that farming is at a crossroads is something of an understatement. The economic, the political and the actual climate all present real challenges that farmers are having to contend with on a daily basis. The first wave of coronavirus in the spring caused massive disruption for many in the food supply chain. And the second wave, which is now well and truly upon us, is likely to compound the economic damage with long-term implications for the whole food supply chain. On the policy front, the uncertainty is just as problematic. Uh, from post-Brexit trade negotiations with the EU and others to the slowly emerging new domestic policy that will, in time, replace the CAP. It's a very clouded picture. But here, to hopefully blow away some of those clouds and to shed some light on what the future holds, we have a highly distinguished panel of speakers. Brian Richardson is Head of Agriculture at the Clydesdale and Yorkshire Bank, a post he's held for the past two years following a career in agribusiness, lastly as Chief Executive of the h, h Group in Carlisle. Sean Ricard is always referred to as a former Chief Economist at the NFU, but since those halcyon days in the 1990s, uh, he's been a leading academic at Cranfield University, a government advisor, and now runs his own consultancy. Joe Stanley, he is a Leicestershire mixed farmer and a Farmers Weekly columnist. Active in both conventional and social media, he's also vice chair of his local NFU and a trustee of the Henry Plum, Plum, Henry Plum Foundation. And we have Will Jackson, uh, who's originally from a Derbyshire dairy farm. Uh, much of his career was spent as a senior agricultural manager at the co-op, and he's now AHDB's chief strategy officer. Uh, the fifth speaker is Neil Parrish. Uh, he's a former MEP and now Conservative MP for Tiverton and Honiton. Uh, he also chairs the Cross-Party Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee, the AFRA Committee, um, a role that he's had for five years. Uh, I'm afraid Neil's not quite with us yet uh, because he's involved in, in, I think, three parliamentary votes um, in the Commons at the moment, uh, but will be joining us uh, before too long, hopefully. So uh, those are the speakers. Um, we've also received an enormous number of questions already, which is great, and we'll try to get through as many of those as possible uh, later on. Uh, this webinar is due to last for one and a quarter hours, so I think we should just get straight into business uh, kicking off with Brian Richardson. Brian. Uh, Brian, I think if you could unmute and uh, then we'll get going. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for that uh, introduction, Phil. And uh, uh, it's great that so many people are joining us this evening. Um, just to share one or two slides with you, and as uh, Phil alluded to, uh, certainly very much uh, a changing pattern uh, in terms of where we are with agriculture. We've got three major challenges uh, at the moment around Brexit, around the net zero agenda, and also around uh, new technology as well. So an awful lot going on in, in the sector um, lots of change happening and massive change really, after, particularly around Brexit, where we've had policy driven for 50 years. Michael Gove described these uh, changes we're seeing as uh, the biggest change in uh, 50 years. Uh, and uh, it's certainly uh, uh, part of that. And also uh, he described these changes as a revolution in how we produce our food. Uh, I think very much focused on uh, how he was looking at things in terms of his normal zealous move in terms of moving agricultural policy forward and the other agendas around that. Uh, we also saw some leaked emails that suggested Britain didn't need farmers and uh, how that worked in, in practice and also the suggestion that we actually didn't need any uh, UK food production at all and could simply import the food. So we've had an agenda really which has been very focused and, and to some extent fairly negative against farming uh, over the last few months. And then, of course, we were challenged with COVID-19, 
Uh, and that uh, certainly, as Phil alluded to in the spring, brought considerable challenge to the industry. Um, very much uh, a, a difficult situation for the whole of society. But I think particularly in terms of agriculture, we had those two months in the spring where we had massive hiatus over food supply as we looked how we could uh, readdress the, the balance between that 20% of food that was going into uh, agricultural, uh, sorry, was going into the uh, food service industry that needed redistributing in, into agriculture. Uh, so big change going on there. Um, around COVID. Resilience, uh, I think, was demonstrated by the sector. As I say, we had two months, really, of uh, some hiatus in the sector, some real challenge, milk going down the drain, etc., uh, and looking to adapt to those new uh, circumstances. But it did highlight the requirement for food security, and if nothing else, I think COVID has helped reset the debate going forward. If you just run forward uh, two or three slides, please, to 2021 and, and beyond. Thanks very much for that. So I think as a result of, of all that, a very challenging time around Brexit and, and all the changes that have happened, uh, we have this new focus on, on food security, uh, uh, certainly uh, a helpful debate going on around food standards now, and I know uh, Neil Parrish and, and Joe's very much involved in that debate and, and driving it forward around where the future of agriculture uh, perhaps lies. Alongside that, we have this environmental agenda and the net zero agenda, understanding uh, what the public are looking from that. Governments announced uh, that the green recovery is very much going to be part of the COVID recovery as well. So that will become more to the forefront. Improving productivity, which is something I've uh, uh, chatted on about really for the last uh, few years in terms of the challenge. It's a challenging area to talk about. Uh, but I think we recognise whilst we have some really good farming businesses in, in the country, there's a lot more we can do there in terms of moving it forward, uh, particularly around uh productivity and, and efficiency and i believe we can do that in terms of uh, focusing on on it while still looking at environmental stewardship and in a very sustainable way uh, and that very much fits in i think with increased use of ag tech we've got some fantastic agricultural technology coming along incredibly quickly now and and it, it does work which has always been a challenge for the industry in the past and this isn't just about robots uh, and drones, it's about big data, it's about supporting precision farming, uh, evolving farming systems using that data. And I think we've got a good example there with a pig and poultry industry, incidentally, two uh, unsupported sectors that have used that uh, technology incredibly well to really develop their industry and, and create it into a real focus going forward. So I think uh, a lot going on in terms of 2021 and beyond and the areas we're going to have to look at. Uh, and it is very much about preparing your business for that uh, new future. What is your plan for the future uh, in terms of your own business? Securing a future without direct payments, that 2.7 billion that's talked about of, of support payments, uh, they're going to be redistributed in different ways. Um, there's some figures that suggest over 50% of the profit in agriculture is accounted for in their support payments. So there is going to be massive change. And how prepared is your business at looking at, at how to deal with that change and potentially less uh, support payments coming through and certainly not in a universal way. Do you know how you're performing now uh, in terms of your own business? We don't do an awful lot of benchmarking as an industry, but it is incredibly important you know how, how you're operating. Do you know what's involved in reducing your carbon footprint? We've got some fantastic carbon audit tools. Uh, Farmers Weekly were uh, featuring those a few weeks ago. It's a great article to read, but there are now some really good tools where you can measure your uh, CO2 emissions. But also importantly, I think you can start to see some of the opportunities that are there uh, and some quick wins, which also improve efficiency. So it's understanding where those public good payments are going to fit in your business. I think we will see some divergence between food production um, and those who focus very much on environmental gains. So 
there will be different farms doing totally different things. I think uh, in terms of adding a big group in the in the middle, uh, balancing up between the environmental and food production. I suspect going forward, we'll still be producing as much food with perhaps fewer farmers. Perhaps one or two farms will get larger as well. Uh, and it won't be for everyone. And I think that's part of the challenge now. And that uh, may see a new generation come through into agriculture. So I do, I think, uh, see a positive future for farming, but it is going to be different. Uh, I think we uh, are very supportive in, in our lending to the sector. It's a very important sector to us as a bank. Uh, and I'm certainly fairly positive for the future, but there are going to be challenges along the way. And it's important farms start to look at their own businesses and the wider supply chain just the same and look at the future. So that's just a few thoughts to start with, but thank you very much, Phil. Thank you very much, Brian. And uh, yeah, I just remember to un unmute myself, so uh, got that one in. Um, okay, our next speaker, if we could go to Sean Rickard, uh, and perhaps Sean, you could share your perspectives uh, on the future of farming. Okay, thank you, Phil. and. Um Good evening, everyone. I'm just waiting for my slides to come up, um, but um, I don't have much time, so I have to. I'll keep going while I'm waiting for them to arrive. Essentially, um, in talking about the challenges facing um, the industry, COVID, I think, will have absolutely no impact on the um, future production of food or consumption. Uh, we know that based on the. Um, Var, ZARS and uh, avian flu in the past. What I'm more interested in is the impact of Brexit. And Brexit, no doubt, will lead to um, a um, certain amount of chaos in the early part, perhaps throughout uh, the next year. But I, agriculture is a long term industry and we really have to be thinking five, ten years ahead. And the logic of Brexit is that we're going to do trade deals with countries that can produce agricultural commodities at much lower price than we can here. And therefore, the logic is that going forward, um, the agricultural industry is going to increasingly be exposed to the threat of imports um, from these low cost global uh, producers. And we can't reverse Brexit. so. My uh, perspective is to say, what can we do in order to protect the industry and give it a bright future? And I think it has, therefore, to rise to three challenges. The first one is we're already a high standard industry, but we have to go on raising our standards. We have to um, not only improve animal welfare and safety, but something we rarely talk about. We have to improve the standards for those who work in the industry and indeed um, their careers. Uh, we then move on to sustainability and um, of course we're all um, environmentalists now and the industry has got to play its part in uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and indeed pollution in general but also in raising productivity what it needs to do is to use less of the world's natural resources. It's got to get more output per unit of water, more output per unit of energy, more output per unit of minerals and so on. So increasing sustainability is very important. And thirdly, the third challenge is it has to uh, become internationally um, competitive. Uh, so um, in improving its productivity, it's got to combine that with the production of food products, um, which um, are attractive to uh, domestic consumers and also overseas um, consumers. They've got to be affordable. And if we can achieve a more internationally competitive food industry, we will automatically improve our trade balance. We will automatically increase our self-sufficiency and we will also increase food security and we'll do it all without turning back towards protectionism, which is really not an option in the modern world. Of course, the domestic um, uh, market is very important to us, but it's growing very slowly. We have an affluent, well-fed population. On the other hand, we have a growing middle class in the world, forecast to rise to about 4 billion people by 2030. Their food demand for food products is growing at about 5% a year. And really, that's where we have to focus. Now, if I was a politician, I'd say, oh, yes, these three challenges, very good. We've got to achieve all three. 
that's because they're politicians. If they were realistic and strategists, they'd realize they've got to focus on one of them. One has got to be the priority and subject to the other two constraints. And for me, there's no doubt the priority is we have to become internationally competitive if we are going to rise to the challenge of Brexit. And if we now go on to food policy on my next slide, very important point I want to make. I hear politicians talking about agriculture becoming globally competitive. I don't know what planet they're on. They're not dealing with reality. If we're going to be internationally competitive, it has to be supply chain based. In other words, we're never going to compete with America in producing things like grain, never going to produce, uh, compete with Brazil on things like um, just beef, but we can compete with these people in terms of food products. Distinctive value added food products are the secret of our success. And, you know, whiskey is an old tale now, but it does uh, represent the sort of thing I have in mind. What do I mean by distinctive um, food um, product? I mean, of course, the usual um, attributes of value and um, taste, but in Increasingly important for the domestic population and indeed um, the global um, middle class are credence attributes. These are attributes you can't touch or see, but they're increasingly important and include, of course, things such as safety, providence, sustainability and animal welfare. And here's the important point. If this is the key to our competitiveness going forward, they are all delivered at the farming stage. and. Knowledge of that tells us that what we have to do is introduce vertical relationships. We have talked about this for over 30 years, but we have made very little progress because they're very difficult, in fact. But they're based on trusting cooperative relationships um, between farmers and processors. And it's only through vertical relationships that we can bring forward the transparency that is necessary if we're going to deliver um, this um, international competitiveness. Now, we also need productivity, and that must be based on sustainable intensification. Intensification uh, tends to um, have something of a, um, you know, with a lot of people think it's a bad word. This is absolute rubbish. It is the secret of um, environmental improvements. It's only through intensification we can release land for trees, for, uh, for habitats, and we can concentrate production on agricultural land that is most suited um, to production. And that means um, we can avoid a lot of um, pollution and things. Sustainable intensification is based on agrobiotechnology. That is the fruits of science and technology. And in this country, we have some of the foremost uh, universities and research um, institutes in the world in these areas. And also, once we apply the fruits of agrobiotechnology, that means getting more output per unit of input, uh, we must not waste it at the farm level. And we do that via precision farming, the fusion of um, engineering and information technology that will make us more efficient, reduce waste. And that, of course, is also necessary um, for sustainability. But if we're really going to move ahead with this, of course, we need to recognize that agriculture is becoming um, a digital high tech industry where the um, People in the industry, whether they're farmers or their employees, are going to have to get used to dealing with very large data sets and making decisions in real times. And that's a new skill set. And um, frankly, um, people have got to retrain uh, for it. So my final point, and I apologize, I'm getting old and perhaps a little cynical in my old age, but the agricultural bill hardly deals with these matters. You have about 80 pages of which less than one deals with the factors I have just spoken to you um, about. It is in my opinion, um, it's down the bottom of my slide at this point, in my opinion, it is the, um, it is mainly a land management policy. And as I said, I'm a little cynical. I think it has been designed to support a shrinking food industry. If we want a prosperous, go ahead agricultural industry as part of a food chain. We need a food policy such as I've outlined. We can't change the agricultural bill at this stage, but we could add a preamble saying that the priority is an internationally competitive food industry. At least it would give farmers and food producers a stick to beat the government with as we go forward. 
Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, Sean. As, as ever, uh, thought-provoking stuff. Uh, right, we've heard from a banker. Uh, we've heard from an economist. Uh, I see we've also got the politician sitting there as well, but I, if you don't mind, Neil will come to you a little bit later because I think it's time uh, we moved on to a farmer. Um, and very pleased that uh, we've got Joe Stanley with us. So over to you, Joe. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Perish the thought, an actual farmer. Uh, we're actually receiving some uh, very welcome rain here uh, today in Leicestershire. Uh, so it was a bit nip and tuck whether I'd therefore be broadcasting from the drill. Um, but at least I'll feel better for having not drilled any wheat in September this year, um, which, uh, you know, IPM and all good stuff like that, I'm very pleased to say. So what I'm uh, looking at doing today is uh, to look back with a, a perspective on, uh, on our industry from 2040, um, an imaginary perspective from 2040. What might we see? Well, hopefully uh, a more modern, sustainable and socially integrated industry than we might recognise today. Um, from the vantage point of 2040, uh, it's clear that the triple shocks of Brexit, COVID-19 and the rapid onset of the climate crisis in the early 2020s instigated a widespread change as it was realized that our cheap food at all costs uh, priority as a society was badly misjudged. Um, we started to see a fundamental reappraisal of the value of food in society, whether around food security, uh, the health benefits of eating well, or the environmental sustainability of high food standards. Now, Brexit exposed the fragility of our just-in-time supply lines, which were so exposed to disruption, but not only from political interference and uh, from trade disputes, but also uh, to climate extremes. We made the policy decision as a country in the 2020s, therefore, to invest in our farmers and reverse the declining trend uh, of national food self-sufficiency in indigenous foods. In particular, the parlous levels of fresh fruit and veg production. Uh, this was linked with an appreciation that we literally are what we eat, uh, that our national food, agriculture, environment and health strategies are all interlinked, um, as outlined in the National Food Strategy uh, published in the 2020, early 2020 um, by Henry Dimbleby. Now, we made a concerted effort after that to avoid the feared two-tier food system, and it was made a basic right that every citizen in this country had access to plentiful, affordable and high-quality healthy food. But we also realized that we needed to build greater resilience into our farming systems, whether around water management, capturing the ample winter rainfalls uh, that we were getting and, and then uh, transferring it around the country uh, for the staggeringly uh, bad droughts that we started to experience in the late uh, 2000s, uh, in the summer and uh, early autumn. Uh, the return of mixed farming and wider rotations, more livestock in our systems, and ultimately even biotechnology to help to reduce inputs and help generate greater climate resilience. <clears throat> now, we also saw primary producers begin to take more than the unsustainable 7% of the agri-food value chain that they were uh, receiving in 2020 through a combination of legislative pressure on retailers and processors, but also a greater role for farmer cooperatives and also farmers selling more directly to the public. And then, of course, 2040, we have the NFU's net zero ambition. And indeed, agriculture did lead the way in the decarbonisation of the British economy, um, improving production efficiencies via measures such as precision farming, the eradication of endemic animal disease and uh, reinvestment in modern infrastructure. But we also began sequestering larger quantities of biogenic carbon uh, via better soil management, afforestation and peatland restoration. And we invested in renewable energy generation. We became a world leader in climate friendly food. Of course, after COVID, where people realise that food doesn't just come magically from Tesco, and with the increasingly visible challenge of feeding sustainably 9 billion people by 2050, uh, a generation of young people began to see agriculture and all the associated industries around it um, as a realistic and attractive career path in all of its enormous variety. And we managed to not only retain more of our existing talent from within the industry, uh, but we also attracted those from a wide and diverse range of backgrounds from outside the industry. And this, of course, led to a huge influx of new ideas and creativity and a boom in such sectors as urban vertical farming and hydroponics of high value crops. And of course, then there's the environment. 
And in the face of overwhelming public concern about the offshoring of our environmental footprint abroad and biodiversity loss, government began to actually work with farmers rather than against them to combat biodiversity decline. And a true value was attached to those famous public goods, which reflected their genuine worth to society and didn't force farmers to choose between the environment and their own bottom lines. But of course, returning to today, all of this and any possible bright future for our industry is only possible with the right support now in 2020. Our industry is not in a financial place for post-Brexit agricultural policy to be left wanting or for a five-year bedding in period before faults are addressed. We need to be fit for purpose from day one. And of course, that day is getting ever closer now. Whether it's financial support, issues around ELM, trade, the availability of labor, especially for that healthy fruit and veg sector, or fairness in the supply chain. These are all critical issues which have to be addressed now. We've had four years uh, for government to develop a vision for food farming in the rural economy, and it's well past time that we now saw that. But for all the smoke and mirrors, Brexit does provide us with a genuine opportunity to create a food farming and trade policy fit for the 21st century. To not do so would be a purely political choice, which we cannot afford to take. The will, ideas and raw materials are present within the industry today, as is the public support in the country at large. We just need now the political support to achieve a thriving, sustainable future for our industry and our food system. Thank you very much, Chu. That was excellent. Uh, they say some, some farmers have a glass half empty and some have a glass half full, but uh, your optimism suggests yours is overflowing. Right. Um, if we could move now to Will Jackson, AHDB, and uh, let us hear your perspectives uh, on, on the subject. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very, thanks very much, Phil. And it's uh, it's great to hear um, Joe highlight some of the real positives that are out there at the moment and are living and breathing across uh, farms and growers and right across the country. Um, I think that, you know, it's always um, more difficult going a little bit away from these things because a lot of things have already been covered off. And the areas that I just wanted to talk about were the fact that no matter, I think the key thing here, that no matter what happens, it's going to be different in future. So we are going to have to adapt as an industry to be able to make sure that we are fit for the future. And so, several of the um, areas that have already been covered off are really, really important in this. So we know that there's going to be a, a change to, um, to policy and whether that's, um, whether that's through um, trade policy, whether that's through the move away from direct payments towards, um, towards ALMS, that means that we're going to have to operate in a different way to be able to access that. And I think a really real key part of this is actually being able to understand about how we can do that in the most effective way. And then as we as we move through, we've got to look at all the aspects of the supply chain as well. And I think one that's probably not been touched on that much already is looking at consumers and the way the consumers are going about uh, are going about consuming the products that, where, that everybody who's listened to this works so hard to produce. And we'd already seen a change over the last uh, last two or three years, a real change. The reputation of the industry being questioned in a lot of quarters, and especially if you look at some of the some of the livestock sectors, especially some real tough questions been asked and people. Pretending well, moving away from consuming those products. Now, what we've seen in the short term from a, from a COVID point of view is another change in consumer behaviour where actually the short term has made some people reevaluate their decisions that they're making and look at doing things differently. What that's going to mean again as we move a little bit further forward is that, um, and with, there's been a piece of research just done recently on this, is that people are going to start probably tightening the belts and looking at how they are again purchasing their food, about how they're consuming the food, about where it's consumed. So we have to keep a real a real close eye on how those consumers domestically are um, are operating because that at the moment is the greatest market for a lot of our products. But then you look a bit further afield and some of the imports and exports that um, that we've already touched on a little bit are going to become very important. And with a lot of these things, uh, there are challenges, but there are also huge opportunities. So we realise that, um, that as we as we move as we as the EU exit becomes closer, that actually we are going to have a different trading relationship with the uh, with the rest of the world and with um, with Europe. And um, what that means is that we will be exposed to to greater greater imports from different areas. However. 
there, that also does offer some opportunities on the back on the on the flip side of that, and that can be around looking at um, caucus balance and how we're able to get, as Sean talked about earlier on, about how we're able to get high quality product away and how we're able to use that in the best way for our supply chains. So when we look at it, I think we've got to make sure we're looking at both sides of the coin as well to, to make sure that we are making the absolute most of these opportunities. And that kind of flows into some of the, some of the other areas around environmental impact. We know that that's very high on people's on, on, uh, consumers' radars, and we know that that will continue to be so. And it may have just uh, gone a little bit quiet over the last six or eight months while COVID has been uh, front and centre. However, we know that's going to come back again, and it's not something that we can shy away from. And, um, and uh, the signals in terms of where policy is going means that we will be moving towards um, towards looking at environment in a, in a greater way. And I think that the, uh, another really important thing is that people uh, people try and embrace that where they can do it because we talk, we'll talk a little bit about food standards and, and everything else I'm sure as we go through this uh, as we go through today but actually making sure that we are doing the absolute best we possibly can do across the sector is going to put us in the in the best possible uh, in the best possible place I think the other thing I just wanted to touch on quickly was around uh, around technology and data and I think as we as we move over this next few years now technology is um, is improving at a huge rate and will enable us to be able to become more productive and effective with what we do but i think data is going to play a really really important part in this um, we, we look at reputation at ahdb and then we also look at how we can evidence that so how can we use data effectively to be able to push us in the right direction make sure we're looking at the right um, right areas to focus on but then also how can we use data and evidence to be able to provide the evidence that we are doing the right thing and we're heading in the right direction so i think a greater uptake of data and its analysis and then putting it into practice is going to be really really important for us to be able to make strides forward and i think we'll see more and more of that grow over the next year and uh, over the next few years and i think it's a really really key part of what, where we're looking at ahdb as our new strategy that evidence really has to underpin everything that we're doing um, i don't want to repeat what everybody else has said so far so i think i'll leave it at that and then we can move on to the the questions after we've uh, done this piece Okay, thanks, Will. Um, not going to quite move on to the questions yet because uh, we have a politician in our midst. Um, apologies to you, Neil, for keeping you waiting to, to the end. Uh, but there again, I'd mentioned I had to sit through a six hour debate in the House of Lords uh, last week on the Egg Bill. Uh, so um, I know we're all gifted with patience. Uh, but perhaps um, if you could just uh, give us a, a few of your immediate thoughts. Uh, on the future of farming, what it looks like post-COVID and Brexit, and then we'll move into questions. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Philip, and thank you very much for sort of organising this seminar. And I see you're being sponsored as association with the banks. It's always good to have friendly banks, uh, you know, putting my previous farming hat on and, and still farming now. So, um, yes, I was very, I like to actually listen to the other speakers before I speak. It's always a good thing to do. Um, and um, I found myself, you know, in remarkable agreement with Sean for once, um, which is always interesting um, and always worrying. Um, but uh, I'm only teasing him. But um, also with Joe, um, a very optimistic view, Joe, and I think one that we need to probably get on to the front foot on, because I think we do spend a lot of our time at the moment being very pessimistic, where I don't think we need to be. So I would say the political world, as far as farming concerned, is actually getting better. I would suggest that the Trade and Agriculture Commission that's now coming about uh, is good news. We've got to make sure that it's strengthened. We've also got to make sure that it can look at individual trade deals as we do them because we do have to be careful as we do trade deals to make sure we are trading a very similar commodity and not exactly the same so the the standards of environment the standards of welfare are important especially on poultry on pigs um, and on on grass-fed uh, beef and lamb so I'm you know looking forward to, to, to keeping the pressure on that also on COVID we did a, the EFRA committee did a report where we did find that it was very much a just-in-time food supply. So we do have to be careful now as we leave finally the EU that we don't have too many checks and balances on the border and that we can physically get that food through and import it and export it. Um, I've largely given up the will to live on what system it will be, but I just want to make sure there is a system that works and works reasonably quickly. I also think that with consumers, we will, farmers will need to get much 
closer to consumers, much closer, dare I say it, to the big retailers as well, but to make sure we actually get a fair deal out of this and get a, a better amount, higher than the 7% that we're getting at the moment, you know, from the general food chain. I think we can do it. I think we can be very practical and efficient. But I also think we farmers need the tools to be able to deliver, both environmentally and deliver food. So as we go forward, we've got to be careful that we do have the crop protection there that we can use. We do actually need, I think, in the future to look at GM, to look at biotechnology, to look at genotechnology, because I think there is a lot there to be done. So we have the government, you know, and I, I speak now as a scrutineer of government, not actually, you know, I'm a supporter of the government, but I am there to actually criticize them when I believe they've got it wrong and there to help them get it right. That's my view of life anyway. They don't always quite see it that way. But, you know, clearly, I think we have got to have in the agriculture bill, and this is where I agree with Sean, is there has never been enough about food. There's never been enough about food production. And also, as we want to you know, have a, a better, cleaner environment, we need to keep glyphosate there because we need to have minimal cultivations. You know, we have got to be sensible about neonics when we're actually importing sugar, uh, sugar beet product um, and oilseed rape from a from other parts of, the, of Europe and across the world that have been used, these these um, substances have been used. So all of these things, I think, are there. And so we've got to put the mix together. And then finally, because I think we need to get on the questions, is that I think the what's going to happen with the basic farm payment is it it's going to move naturally and it's going to be transferred from 21 onwards. I can see a system coming in by 20. 425 um, to actually help farmers with a, a payment that will will keep them you know in a reasonable place until the elms kick in a little bit later um, before 25 26 defra is behind on this there's no doubt about that but they are beginning to catch up we've got to make sure again that these systems are practical um, and that in the end that we can have a good environment but we can also farm and produce real food and this you know we do also have to have some intensive farming because our our intensive poultry and pigs in this country are probably second to none uh, and, and we have got to be careful naturally as we do these trade deals that we don't because the, the, the chlorinated chicken as you well know is it, the chlorination itself is no problem with it because we we wash lettuce in the same process but what is the problem is twice as much antibiotic use and much more densely populated poultry in the US. So, you know, let's go into these trade deals with a clear, clear vision. We can export lamb to America, all being well, with a trade deal. So those are the keys to it. And of course, finally, you know, as we leave Europe, naturally, we need to try and make sure it is a tariff-free system. But my view is if we get to a system where there are tariffs, make sure that we charge tariffs on the imports as well as being charged on the exports. Otherwise, we give our farming industry away for nothing and we're unlikely to get that trade deal. So I think hardball is being played at the moment, but I think that is exactly right to do so. So I will park it there, Philip, because I'm sure people have got plenty of questions to ask and I'm more than happy to try and answer them. Okay, thanks very much, Neil. Um, brilliant off-the-cuff speaking as ever. Um, and you're right, we do have uh, have plenty of questions here. Um, I'm going to take a couple that came in before, although we have had a good, good flow of questions coming up on the board throughout the discussion as well. Um, and the first uh, two questions, which I'll put to the whole of the panel, um, are around the subject of trade. So the first one uh, from one of our listeners was... Uh, does the panel trust the government to stick to its manifesto commitment to uphold UK food standards? And a supplementary, does the way the government is negotiating trade deals make sustainability and viability more difficult for British farmers? So the first question about uh, do we trust the government uh, on food standards? And secondly, through the, the trade deals that are being negotiated, uh, is that going to challenge sustainability and viability uh, for British farmers? Um, just picking a name out of the hat, let's go for Sean on that one, please. I will come back to you. Um, I will come back to you, Neil, on whether we should trust the government. 
Well, yes. I mean, when people write manifestos, perhaps um, they always want expect a little bit of latitude. Let's be quite clear. The government um, is not going to agree to have its hands tied in trade deals. The whole purpose of Brexit, as far as the government was concerned, was to undertake trade deals. And it cannot go into a trade deal with its hands tied behind its back. And we've known for more than 50 years. And the Americans make no secret of it. We know that there will be no trade deal with America unless their farmers can have access to the UK market. So that's where we are. And you can huff and puff and uh, question whether they really knew what they were putting in their manifesto. But of course, you know, it's an elastic word standards, etc. America would say they have their standards and we have ours, etc. So, you know, my point is that um, the, the government's going to have to um, take a different interpretation on its manifesto if it's going to get a trade deal. I do not believe that negotiating trade deals will have any problem when it comes to sustainability. After all, I've argued that if we're going to be competitive, are we going to deliver the environment that people want? We've got to, um, you know, adopt high tech practices, etc. And as far as I'm concerned, they go hand in hand with a trade deal. So sustainability, absolutely no contradiction between that and a trade deal. Viability, well, I would argue that unless the farming industry really devotes, the farming and food industry, I should say, unless they devote attention to the issues I've spoken about, then the viability of many farmers is under threat. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Sean. Um, I could see you smiling a little bit there, Neil. So um, are you not to be trusted on this? Yeah, I was I was just thinking my you know my my new now you found friend in Sean you know it's the, the friendship hasn't lasted too long has it or not the friendly cupboards but um, no I was just going to say really is that I think we can do these trade deals uh, but I do actually believe that some standards need to be put in there because you see you only have to look at the American production of chicken it is only about 20 to 25 percent of their chicken that they produce in a very very um, intense way um, and use a lot of antibiotics and they use this chlorine wash to make them safe to eat they're perfectly safe to eat but there is a real problem with both animal welfare and with using greater antibiotics so I think that is a legitimate reason to put that into a trade deal, and I will fight that all the way. And I think the government is actually coming around to that thinking. And we, Theresa Villiers and I had a meeting with, a private meeting with the Prime Minister. Um, I am reasonably confident that we can get to a situation where we can do a trade deal and we can have some systems in place where there is equivalence of standards of production both in America and here. And they've done it with other countries. They can do it with us. The fact they want to actually unload, dare I say it, a lot of this chicken onto our market because it suits them is fine. But we don't have to agree to that. That is what a trade deal's about. Good for everybody. And so therefore, I'm going to try and make sure that it's good for us and good for the Americans. I think we can get, you know, a good amount of lamb into America. And I think further down the road, dare I say it, the deals that we will probably need to be very careful over is deals with both Brazil and Argentina. Because I think if you want to look at a big food, you know, the, the superpower of food production, both in soya, um, in, in sugar and in beef, you're probably looking at the Brazilians. Now, we're not there yet. But that's why this Food Standards Commission does have to look at it. And if you are actually running your cattle towards the rainforest, if you're actually plowing up your savanna in order to produce sugar cane, then it is an environmentally legitimate reason in a trade deal to ask these questions. Our public are very strong on it. And so therefore, we can actually produce that food sustainably. We can keep that permanent grass there and actually keep those, those sheep and cattle out there on it. So like I said, let's actually be strong in our trade deal. So the answer is we are doing I think the government will hold hold firm, but we do have to watch very strongly what it does, and that's my job to try and do it. And I assure you, um, uh, one thing, as Sean and others know, I will not be silenced, um, and uh, I will not be silent on this matter, I promise you. <clears throat> Okay, thanks very much. Um, 
And uh, perhaps um, Joe, as an informed farmer, uh, if you could give us your thoughts on that, and then I will move on to some different questions. We've got a lot coming in. Thanks, Phil. Um, do I trust the government to keep its manifesto commitment um, to maintain um, standards in trade? No. Um, for a government which says it, uh, and as we've already covered, you know, um, Neil is not the government. Neil uh, does not represent the government, so I accept him from these comments entirely. Um, but for a government which says it has the noblest intentions when it comes to this issue, it's doing a, an excellent job of burning all the possible goodwill with industry when it comes to uh, to maintaining that manifesto commitment. Um, you could argue uh, that we, we've seen uh, clear indications of this already so far. You know, Neil's own amendment to the Agriculture Bill was defeated in the House of Commons by the government on a three-line whip. Um, and, you know, the, the excuse being, well, it couldn't possibly work. Uh, in reality. Um, of course, Neil, uh, as we all know, is no fool. He would have not have put together that amendment and uh, knowing that it was legislatively unworkable. Uh, it would have worked, but it was defeated by government regardless. Um, you know, we look at the current situation around the, uh, the consultation on reducing cane sugar tariffs to zero, uh, which would benefit precisely one company, which of course is Tate and Lyle to the benefit of nearly 73 million pounds per year. That would be undercutting our world-leading um, British sugar industry, our sugar producers in this country uh, who produce the most sustainable sugar in the world. Um, that's sort of an indication of where trade policy is currently moving. That's a first indication, and it's very troubling indeed. Um, but no, uh, if a government is willing to break international treaty obligations, um, I have no doubt that it would be willing to fudge a manifesto commitment when it comes to food trade standards. Um, and that is uh, that is highly concerning, I think, for very many people in the agricultural community. But it is becoming, you know, increasingly uh, transparent that perhaps that is the way we are headed. Uh, but of course, we need to hold government to account on that. And that is something that obviously, you know, Neil, as chair of the Africa Committee, is doing a great job of. OK, thanks. Thanks, Joe. Um, right. We had another question in before the session started. Uh, which I'll quickly read out. It says, will the political wish to keep our nation fed on cheap food by massive imports from overseas, another import related question, force our nation into a vulnerable dependency for consistent supplies from overseas? So it's really a question around self-sufficiency and uh, the extent to which we should be concerned about where we are at the moment, or is trade going to uh, provide all the solutions? Uh, Will, perhaps you would like to address that one from uh, AHTB point of view. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, as I mentioned in my my introduction, is that the 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 changing the change that we're going to see is going to expose us to more challenges, and there's no doubt about that. And that's going to be depend on a sec, on a sector by sector basis. It's going to be different depending on whether you're a livestock producer or a cereal producer, and it is going to put some pressure on. But I think we do also have to look at the the positives that that will drive. And as I mentioned before, it's really really important in the export markets for our carcass balance in the livestock sectors to be able to keep accessing uh, markets around. And as Sean touched on previously, there are going to hopefully be part of the opportunities where the middle classes are growing in some of the Far Eastern countries to be able to um, to be able to get product in. And you know, and today we've had there's been uh, over the last few days there's been an announcement about the opening of um, of market access for beef into America. So there are two sides to this. Yeah, but yes, there is going to be more pressure put on the domestic market. I think we've got to remember as well that we are already in that important when it comes to food as it is at the moment. And we've got a real we've got a real balance about what we bring in and what we send out. So we're very used to working in a in a position where we are where the, this trade differential comes in i think that um what we've got some absolutely fantastic farms over here who are doing a really really good job at what they do i think we've got to make sure that we are remaining as pro and trying to increase our productivity where we can do and we're looking at abilities to be able to do that so whether that's looking at, um, at benchmarking on farm whether it's looking at other way other ways of um, of improving the way that we're able to produce product um, so I think as long as we are trying to improve what we are doing over here, as long as we are taking full advantage of, um, of the opportunities that are out there for exports and that we are promoting in the right way, then we should hopefully be in a, in a strong position. I think that there is just another slight point within this as well, that, that when we look at it, 
trade, especially for some sectors, probably isn't going to be the huge thing. The change in, in, in policy and agricultural policy is going to have a bigger impact on quite a few sectors than, than, than trade is. So we get very, very caught up sometimes in trade and imports and exports. But we also have to make it now, keep an eye on the fact that there is going to be a huge amount that rests on the way that agricultural policy goes. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, Brian, perhaps uh, if you could give your thoughts on, on self-sufficiency, is 60% uh, where we are uncomfortable or acceptable? Well, I, th I think it's where we've got to really, so it, it, it's where the, the balance falls. Um, I think it, it's interesting when you look at that cheap food coming from aboard, what's driving it? We know in the UK, I think we've, we've got the the third lowest amount per household uh, spent on food. So UK farming is already doing a tremendous job in terms of providing that uh, food at an incredible price and, uh, and at a very high standard. So I think standards come into that as well. And I, I think some of that around is, is what the supermarkets will do going forward and, and those food businesses. So I think it's inherent on the industry really to promote what UK farming is, the standards they have, uh, and the food that's actually produced to, to keep the supermarkets going. So I think you know it slid down to this 60 to 70 percent, depending which figure. It's important we uh, maintain that going forward. That needs a viable and sustainable industry, so we do need to drive that. And we've talked about productivity, and, and Will's mentioned that again. Uh, but I think it, it's also about uh, maintaining those standards we have having as level playing field as, as we can possibly have uh, and making sure that the, the British public is aware of uh, what uh, a fantastic offering UK food is in the first place. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm kind of selecting speakers at, at random, well not quite at random, to answer uh, questions, but if any of the speakers sort of desperately want to chip in on something, just give me a wave and I'll, I'll come to you as well. Um, right, I'm going to take a question which is around devolution. Uh, we've had a few of those come in uh, through the live chat. Uh, and this one is from James Knott, but it sums up some of the uh, similar comments from others. Uh, he says that uh, with rural policy being devolved, do we need to worry that we could be working to different standards and through different levels of support across the whole of the UK? Does the panel feel that this could lead to a, uh, a diversification in production and practices across the country? So are we looking at uh, different uh, farmers being treated differently in different parts of the UK? And uh, what kind of a problem might that be? Um, so, um, Sean, would you like to give your thoughts on that? And then I'll ask Neil to chip in as well. Sure. Certainly. Um at one level, if we're talking about uh, diversity in terms of production, et cetera, then I can't see any problem with it because that's the heart of competition. We really ought to be quite prepared and grown up to allow people to do things in different ways. What's really lying behind this, I think, is the question of um, subsidies and um, uh, the problem the government has, of course, having um, with devolved administrations is it wants to go out to the world and to negotiate trade deals and it really can't do that if part of the um, country is going to say we're not going to allow you to um, import these foods into Scotland or um, Wales or wherever it is and uh, that's why the government is really having a great attempt at the moment to undermine these um, uh, devolved assemblies and bringing power back to uh, Westminster. I think that's unfortunate. I think we're in a muddle over all the, I never really thought out Brexit and that's most of the problems that we have now. But in principle, having different um, policies in different parts of the UK uh, regarding farming, etc. What's wrong with that? It's competition and uh, people who follow the sort of practices that most people are interested in will gain most from it. No one has got anything to fear about that. Okay. Okay. Um, Neil, your thoughts. 
I mean, I think as far as trade policy is concerned, I would say that it, it's got to be done on a United Kingdom basis because I think the idea of trade of, of um, negotiating different trade deals with Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland and Wales, I think just would not work. So that part of unionism, I very much agree with. Now, what we will have to worry about is that if, for instance, in Northern Ireland, you've got very much family orientated farms, again, in Scotland and Wales, they might decide to put in payments that are much more direct farming payments, very similar to what we've got at the moment. They might decide to put in hedge payments on cattle and sheep. It'll be up to them to decide what they do. Now, if they did that, you would then be in direct competition with English farmers because when, as our payments move towards environmental payments, then they won't be so directed towards agriculture. So I think we just got to be careful as we move forward. Now, devolution allows that to happen so we need to sort of negotiate with uh, with our, our our surrounding countries to make sure that we don't set up huge amount of competition you wouldn't want a, a beef special premium in wales or scotland and not one in england or a sheep payment in northern ireland uh, and not in england um so you know those are the issues that i think we've got to be sensible um as we move forward and, and because we will be creating competition if we're not careful with with subsidy, with taxpayers' money, um, and that, I think, is is totally wrong. And so that's what we've got to iron out. But I think as far as a trade deal is concerned, then I think the idea of, you know, trying to get four countries negotiate a trade deal would be crazy. The United Kingdom is here. It's strong. Um, let's make sure we get that trade deal. I believe Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland can live with it. There's a lot of politics in this um, across the nations on this. Um, and so I think once we've got the deal settled, once we settle down and leave the EU with a with or without a trade deal, I think in some ways things will settle down. There's still a lot of politics in this place because that's what we are, I suppose. Okay. Um, right. This next question, I think, has got Brian's name written all over it. And it is about bank lending. What appetite uh, do the banks have to continue, continue um, lending for purely agricultural purposes uh, post-Brexit and post-COVID, um, especially for the tenanted sector, but, um, but generally? Brian? Just sound a bit as though that's got my name on it, doesn't it? Um, I think um, the sector as a whole, uh, it's been a remarkably uh, robust and resilient sector over the years. And uh, I think uh, as an agricultural business uh, bank, we, we very much supported the sector through some challenging times as well. And, and there were concerns uh, earlier in this year with some of the challenges uh, around COVID there. But I think uh, as a bank, and I, I think the, the other banks are, are the same, very much looking at the industry as a long-term industry. I think... Uh, there's a lot of experience in terms of the managers across the agricultural sector, which is a great asset uh, to the sector as a whole, I think. So I think, uh, yes, uh, support for the overall sector, but it's all about looking at those individual businesses. And I think we will be focusing more and more as we go forward in terms of what their plans are for the future, working without their, their support payments, what are their plans around uh, net zero and, and driving towards that. So I think it is about uh, sustainable business going forward, but I think uh, as a bank uh, and as a sector generally and bank support for it, it will continue to receive support going forward as we see things at the moment, recognising there will be ups and downs along the way and it, it, it is a challenging industry, but it's a long-term industry and over that time uh, it has shown uh, the ability to, to deliver returns um, uh, and work with uh, banks to, to do that. Uh, I think I saw Neil waving at, at the camera, so uh, I'm seeing it again. Uh, being, Neil, being a nice bank in. manager in front of me, I, I can't resist, really. Um, I think the, the, the question was really the tenanted sector, wasn't it, really? And I think, you know, naturally banks lend, uh, I know they, you say you don't, but they you lend a lot on collateral. Uh, and the problem is that with a tenanted farm, there isn't, you know, the high value of land and the land values have not risen naturally because they don't actually own the land. So, you know, to what 
how how can you reassure the tenanted sector really that the banks are there i know it's difficult for you you've got to make a a business decision on who you loan money to but i think the tenanted sector feel particularly vulnerable so what, what what please could you just answer what you know what is your position regarding the ten, regarding the tenanted sector really I, I think um, the tenanted sector d does receive a lot of support. We, we've got an awful lot of uh, customers who, who fall into that area. You're absolutely right. Uh, I think traditionally, uh, you know, the, the asset value has supported lending into the sector. But I think more and more, and, and some of it in terms of uh, banking regulation as well, it's very much looking at the individual business, how that is supporting itself, how it's able to repay any money it's borrowing, the viability of that business over a long time. So I think I, th I think it does come back to farms being able to present a, a story about what they're doing, um, being able to show a plan for the future. And I think whether they're owner-occupied or tenanted, uh, they do receive good support and that recognition is it, long-term, but it, it's a challenge and obviously when businesses are looking to make changes now and, and make that investment, uh, it becomes a bigger challenge. But I, I do think uh, banks very much focus on individual business circumstances more and more now. Thank, thank you for that answer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you indeed. Um, right, next question is around uh, the structure of the industry going forward. Um, and... It, is the inevitable consequence of current post-cap agricultural policy uh, the consolidation and intensification of British farming? Um, I think that's probably a good question for, for Joe uh, to have a go at, please. Thanks, Phil. Um, as I said earlier, um, we can achieve whatever we want. We can make our future agricultural policy uh, however we want to make it. Um, but on the current plans, which basically evolve around an agriculture bill, which, as Neil said, involves very sort of vanishingly little agriculture uh, and is essentially uh, an environment bill, uh, and with elms being explicitly not about food production, um, essentially agriculture in this country is soon to be completely unsubsidized. Um, which obviously will put farmers at a, an extreme disadvantage, really regardless of the trade environment we subsequently find ourselves in. So um, is the inevitable consequence of the plans currently on the table, uh, the intensification and consolidation of the industry? I believe that is true. Um, I think that it will be inevitable that as, food as, as the business of food production becomes ever less profitable and let's not forget how how vanishingly small the profit margins currently are i think um, smaller family farms will be forced to consolidate uh, and i think that within the uh, within the rules of um of what is allowed within the legal structure of what is allowed because make no mistake our domestic production standards will remain high that is absolutely yeah. not in doubt um it's it's the trade issue where the doubt comes in uh, but within what is legally allowed, I think intensification will be the absolutely only consequence. I think in, for example, in my case, our native extensively grazed um, uh, rare breed cattle, well, what place will there be for them in a world where, um, where such things are not rewarded uh, and where essentially farmers are uh, struggling uh, to, to make money from agriculture, uh, you know, where, where that struggle is becoming harder and harder. So yes, uh, intensification, consolidation, the opposite of what the government is wanting to achieve, but the inevitable consequence of uh, the current policies that are on the table. And uh, Sean, you talked about intensification, but uh, there's also a lot of pressure uh, towards agroecology. Uh, is that pie in the sky or do you think there's a role for agroecology in all this? I think there's there's a role for um, all schools on this, but 
You know, the very idea um, that intensification is bad really needs to be um, questioned. Another word for intensification is industrialization. And if we were talking about um, uh, cars or whatever, then we celebrate industrialization and the advantages it's brought to us. And earlier, one speaker said about the fact that households now spend a relatively small proportion of income on food. This is due to industrialization stroke intensification. And as I said in my talk, intensification allows us to focus or concentrate our production on the most appropriate land and release land for environmental purposes. So I think the first thing the industry has got to stop pretending is that somehow or other um, intensification is its enemy. If we don't go down the intensification route, the price of food will go up. If the price of food goes up in a world in which there are going to be less trade barriers, you know what the consequences are going to be. We've got to get realistic about this. We can't shut ourselves off from the world. We can and make a success of what's coming, but only if we adopt certain practices, which half the industry is trying to pretend it doesn't have to bother with. It does, and if it doesn't, then they are going to be the ones that lose. Okay. Okay, and Will, I think you are wanting to chip in as well on this. Yeah, the only thing the only thing I was going to add, and I don't I don't necessarily disagree with Joe that we were um, that we will see more more intensification. I think that the way that we're going at the moment, there might be the flip side to that coin as well, is where if you are looking at um, environmental land management, then mm. actually in some cases um, it may be that you end up with less intense less intensive um, areas where actually it's better. It, you've got to have a different way of thinking. So actually, you're not going to be driving the main income from your production necessarily. It may be coming from the environmental measures that you uh, that you undertake instead. So while there the, while there are two sides to it, I think that, that you probably the majority will be towards that um, towards the, that slightly more intensification. But there will be some people who move in slightly the other direction. So I just think there's a there's a counter side to that as well. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, right, time's moving on a bit. We've probably got time for another sort of three questions, I would guess. Um, and this one is from John Hall. It's, I think it's one of the first ones we received earlier in the evening, uh, who says, does the general public leave their good intentions at the supermarket door? Uh, so I think this is kind of pushing at, um, again, questions about um, whether we're competitive, uh, if we advocate high British standards, is that actually going to count for anything when consumers come to actually make their purchasing? Um, who would like to have a go at that one before I delegate? Joe. Cool. Um, oh, and, and Neil. Okay. okay. So, Will, were you going to go on that as well? Getting a lot of hand waving. Uh, let, um, let's I was, uh, I was, I was just gonna start with Will. Okay, so, so, sorry. Um, yeah, I was just going to say is that um, that from, I mean, I've had a little bit of experience in retail before and we do a lot of looking at um, retail trends and everything through AHD being a lot of consumer insight. And I think that what you see is that generally everybody do want the things that they're going in for. They want to look for high environmental standards. They want to look for high animal welfare. But actually, when it comes to being presented with something at the shelf edge, a lot of the time, we see that there is still a draw to where prices and um, and each everybody's individual circumstances are different, and it's difficult to put everybody into one into one basket, if you like. But people but people do predominantly buy a huge amount of products on price, and I think that's where we've got to make sure that we are that we are and um, continuing to be competitive, as well as producing at all the all the high standards and everything else that we've discussed already. So the, the question about whether people leave their intentions at the door, they don't always leave their intentions at the door, but sometimes they have to be able to shop to the means that, the means they have. Okay, uh, Neil, if you could chip in. Yes, I mean, I think what the, what's the expression, the road to hell is paved with um, good intentions. And I think, that, I think the public have good intentions, uh, but I think they get seduced by lower prices as well. And if, you know, you've got a family of five and you've got a very low income, who can blame you for going for the cheapest in the shop? So I think people are getting more interested in their food. And I think people are, on average, paying a little bit more for it. 
and they are interested in the welfare, interested in it and where it's come from. Um, but of course, the other part is that if you go into your big retailers, yes, you're probably um, looking to a degree at where the foods come from. But in normal circumstances, when we're not in lockdown and what have you, um, so much of the food, what is it, 50% of the food um, is eaten outside of the home. A lot of this is processed food, uh, and that is where your cheapest food will come in because, you know, a lot of these processors are down to very low margins uh, and they will get the cheapest they can get their hands on. Um, and so that's what we've got to be very, very aware of. So I think it's a, it's a mixture of both. And can I... Just say to Joe very quickly on that last question, one of the Elms idea is to link some of the native breeds to the you know to permanent pasture and various other aspects. So your 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 native breed might yet get some support. So don't don't uh, be too pessimistic uh, with the new system. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. And um, uh, Joe, Joe, you're, Joe, you're waving both hands in the air, so you must be <laughs> desperate to double, go for it. Double, double hope. Um, no, thank you for uh, Neil. No, very briefly on this. No, absolutely. The British consumer is is proven in, in poll after poll to be predominantly concerned with price, so much more so than our European uh, consumers. Of course, why is that? In large part, the British consumer has not had to worry about the quality, the safety, and the standards of their food. And there is an element of complacency there. Of course, another thing we have to factor in, of course, is that recent polling by which indicates it's actually those with least um, disposable income who are more concerned about the standards of the food that's being produced. Uh, because, of course, they don't have the choice. Of course, it's up to us as an industry. This is the argument we have to have and we are having. Um, you know, there's a huge amount of public support and groundswell of uh, support at the moment behind British food standards. Yes, the challenge, of course, is to transfer that into actual cash payments. And of course, that's where we need to have a, a sustainable food system, which actually allows every person in this country to access high quality food. That is a policy issue. Of course, it's the British uh, farming industry's um, uh, role to make the argument for why people should care about that. Okay, um, I think two more questions we can squeeze in. Uh, this one is, uh, again, that came in earlier, uh, sorry, came in during the course of our discussion from uh, John Johnson. Um, and it's definitely got Neil's name written on it because it says, with three months to go, does Neil really think that the position is anything apart from apocalyptic uh, when he says three months to go i don't think he means until christmas i think he means until brexit day or the end of the um, transition period uh, is it anything other than apocalyptic well i think my glass has always been half full rather than half empty so i've got to say i think there still is hope um, I think it was always going to be a very bumpy road. I mean, I did have 10 years in the European Parliament before, you know, 10 years ago I came here to Westminster. So it's not unusual for a, for a deal with Europe to be very last minute. A lot of politics again. Um, and so therefore I think we, you're right, we've, we've hyped it all up here in Westminster recently with the internal markets bill. But I'm not sure that that is altogether bad when it comes to final negotiation. Uh, and it's going to be quite bloody. Um, do I think we're going to get some sort of deal? Yes. But I think it's going to be a fairly basic deal. Um, and I think it can still be uh, delivered. Uh, but, you know, we are, um, it is getting more and more difficult as time goes by. But I still think something may well come on the table, uh, but it will be a fairly basic deal. Of course, you know, whether whichever side, I mean, I voted Remain and, and campaign Remain, but the country voted to leave. We have left. And so, therefore, if you are going to get any sort of Brexit dividend in the long run, you see, you can't actually agree to be completely tied down to European rules in order to get their perfect deal. So this was always ever going to be rough. Um, I still think we'll get somewhere. Um, but, you know, am I as confident as I was? Probably not, is the answer. Sean, you were shaking your head, then then nodding it and then shaking it. Uh, do, do you see an impending apocalypse? Um, I actually agree with Neil that I think um, Boris will not um, 
that countenance a no deal, whatever he says. Um, the very idea of pushing up people's food prices in the middle of a COVID recession, um, particularly across those northern regions, which we know are going to do very badly from Brexit, um, just is um, unimaginable. Uh, we're going to get a very basic deal. It's not going to be very good for the agricultural industry going forward. Uh, but then agriculture was always going to be sacrificed in this. Those who pushed for Brexit saw opportunities for other industries and agriculture was a sacrificial lamb. And I'm afraid that um, I haven't changed my view on that since uh, 2016. And I think that um, we've got to make the best of it. I'm with Neil that uh, we can't uh, turn the clock back. Uh, but unless we recognize we've got to do something quite dramatic and really focus on food, then I think the future is going to be for a smaller agricultural industry here in order to accommodate the post-Brexit post world that the Brexiteers um, believe in. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, I know we're right up on the deadline now, but uh, just one final question I wanted to, to ask, and that's actually a question from me. Um, and probably well, everywhere in the panel noticed that um, before, um, the, over the weekend anyway, uh, there was a, a deal of criticism about the makeup of the panel, just someone describing us as male, pale and stale. Um, I think male and pale, we can't dispute, stale I'd very much dispute. Uh, but my question that I would like your thoughts on um, would be, do you think that the industry suffers from a lack of diversity? Um, and is there a problem around non-inclusive attitudes, uh, perhaps in relation to gender, race or sexuality, that might be holding the industry back going forward? Um, I think, uh, Joe, you said you might be willing to give some thoughts on that and also will. Thanks, Will. Um, clearly, uh, agriculture is not uh, a mirror which reflects the, uh, the, the full diversity of society. Um, there's no arguing with that. Um, do I feel that there is within our industry uh, attitudes, um, you know, regressive uh, and objectionable attitudes towards uh, the inclusion of diversity? Um, well, I would say absolutely there is. Um, do I feel that that is um, perhaps worse than in society as a whole, unfortunately? I would say probably not. Um, I think this is a, an issue which afflicts, um, afflicts society as a whole. And I would like to think that agriculture is, is no worse affected by that. You know, I know a lot of people, uh, a huge number of people uh, from all sorts of backgrounds um, who are achieving great things within our industry. I'm sure we all do. Um, clearly, we're in a better place than we were 20 or 30 years ago. We're not uh, where, we, we are, where we need to be. We need to challenge, always be challenging um, uh, the lack of uh, diversity. Uh, of course, you know, agriculture is not just about uh, the, 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 the farmer in the field. There's a huge hinterland to our industry. I think there is perhaps a lot more going on there than perhaps there is necessarily on farm. Um, but this is certainly an issue. Uh, you know, there's plenty of organisations now operating within agriculture uh, and, you know, campaigns who are actively bringing this issue to light and individuals within the industry who are certainly making a lot of noise around it. And that is certainly to be welcomed. So, yeah, we, we're, we're, we are uh, not where we want to be. Um, but we need to uh, to make sure that we do improve on this, absolutely. And a, a very quick comment uh, from you, Will, if you wish. Um, yeah, so, um, I mean, all I was, uh, Joe's just um, explained things so eloquently there. Um, I, all I was going to say was that, yes, absolutely, we need to encourage as much diversity as we possibly can do. And the point, one of the points I was going to make was the same with Joe, that actually, if you look probably outside of the farm gate in, some, in a lot of organisations, we are seeing in a real good level of uh, um, diversity. Um, I know that within our organisation, um, we're very proud of the diversity that we have. But we still need to do more, and we need to do more um, to get um, get people from all all backgrounds and um, and uh, as you said at the beginning, gender, race, sexuality it doesn't it doesn't matter what. But we need a good range of diverse thinking within the industry, and that'll help drive us forward. And that diverse thinking is absolutely key in what is a time of huge change. So we do need to encourage it in all the ways that we possibly can do. 
Okay, well, thanks very much, uh, and, and Joe as well. Right, I think that uh, brings us to the end of the session. Um, we just slightly overrun. Um, Brian, I don't know whether you want to sort of say anything just to sort of wrap up a little bit. I know uh, Clydesdale and Yorkshire Bank have uh, kindly been uh, in association with us on this pod uh, on this uh, webinar. Uh, I, would you like to just uh, say a couple of final words? Yeah, no, I think it's been a great debate and a great contribution from, from everyone. Uh, I've been watching the questions coming through and certainly there's been a lot of interest there. So I think uh, it is great to be able to have these debates about focusing on the future of this industry that we're all involved in, uh, a very successful industry. and We all want to keep it successful in, in, in the future. There's a lot of challenges for us going forward. So it is about focusing on that challenge, I think, uh, planning more than ever business planning, uh, but hopefully everyone feels there's, there's been a good, uh, fairly diverse debate tonight, and uh, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed being part of it. Great, thank, thanks very much. Uh, so that that kind of wraps it up. Um, normally, the, I'd be sort of inviting the audience to show a round of applause for everyone, but I think that's probably fairly pointless on a remote uh, webinar. Uh, fist bumps, well, I can't even do that either. So just uh, for me to say thank you very, very much indeed to our speakers and also thank you very much uh, to people that have tuned in, listened in and uh, submitted questions as well. Um, I believe the this session will be available on Farmers Weekly website, FWI, uh, tomorrow, if not tomorrow, then the next day. Uh, so uh, you'll be able to find it then if you missed anything or want to relive anything. Uh, but otherwise, uh, just for me to say, Good night and thanks very much indeed. Thank, thank you, Philip, for sharing.